So a few years ago, I was attending a large church planning conference. And just to give you an image, imagine hundreds of bearded hipsters sporting raw denim and some dark rimmed glasses and their fair trade coffee in hand. And that gives you a pretty good image of what the conference was like. And one of the keynote speakers was a a planter of a thriving church, and his breakout session was just standing room only. And much of the conversation revolved around the the space they renovated and how they canvassed the community and, and what they did to leverage social media. And it was toward the end of that breakout that someone asked a question about how they distinguished between the attender and the visitor and gave pastoral care. And you could tell the the question through the speaker. So he paused for a moment, then he smiled, and he said, yeah, ask me in a few years. We're still putting the plane together in the air. Now the crowd chuckled, you know, and the conversation just moved on. Now fast forward a few years, and friends, sadly, that man is no longer in the ministry. And his once thriving church is in the midst of a, of a crippling identity crisis. Everybody knew who he was. That Nobody in his congregation seemed to have the foggiest idea of who they were to be. And I give this as a cautionary tale, for if you read much of the literature about church planting and church revitalization, The focus is often on how to build a team, how to mobilize your leaders, how to create a shared vision. They'll even talk about community, even if it's largely just boils down to demographic similarities and and a bunch of shared interests. But I want to suggest that one of the most important things you need to do as a planter or revitalizer, just as a pastor, is something that you're not often going to read a lot about in the literature. And it is this, it is to define the community and then draw boundaries around that community. It's to define the community and then draw boundaries around that community. So let's think first for a minute about defining the community, about defining the community. This begins by remembering, first and foremost, what we gather around. And it's not vague notions of spirituality. It's not simply a charismatic personality. It's not that which makes you distinct from all other Protestant churches that ought to define you, but rather that which is the same. Let me say that again. It's not that which is distinct that should define you from all other Protestant churches. It should be that which is the same, namely the Gospel. There's great news that we've been thinking about today of how we are hell-bound sinners who've been given a new destination, new loves, and new affections because of the shed blood of Christ. And so one of the worst things you can do as a regular preacher of the Word is to assume that Gospel. To assume it. As a pastor leader, that begins with you. So make sure your people can first articulate the Gospel before they know how to articulate your own vision statement. Because to assume the Gospel is a surefire path to lose that Gospel. Preaching to Brian Davis is always a joy. In every sermon, preach it, right? God, man, Christ response. And if you live in a place where nominal Christianity is common, where I serve, add cost to it. Add the cost of following Christ. Make it clear that Christ alone is the reason why you gather and not simply a social cause, again, not a charismatic leader. And if we define our community around Christ, that means self-consciously, if we're defining it around Him, we are not defining it around our cultural preferences. So in the state where I pastor, all the rage right now are two things, cowboy churches and biker churches. Some of you are wondering, how is that possible? Right? I can bring you down to my state, I can tell you about it. In your own state, it could be churches for artists, it could be the church for the cultural warriors, the church for homeschoolers, whatever it might be. But if, according to Ephesians 2, the Gospel is indeed the only power that tears down the barriers between cultures and races, creating one new man where there were two, Ephesians 2.15, then why would we want to go backwards and create churches simply based on worldly affinities? Friends, all that does is undermine our witness. It does not enhance it. So define the community, but then secondly, secondly, draw boundaries around that community. Draw boundaries around that community. Now, I recognize as a culture, we don't like drawing boundaries. We don't like drawing lines. We loathe talk of insiders and of outsiders. But as Christians, we just face one small problem. 
namely your Bible, which makes the boundary lines between Christian and non-Christian, the church and the world, exceedingly clear. So I mean, just take the Old Testament. I mean, circumcision was part of how God quite literally meant to show that His people were cut off from the world. Right? They were to be what? Separate and distinct. Evidenced in all the holiness laws, all the purity codes. Not just teaching the people something about God, though they were doing that, but God was teaching His people that they needed to be set apart. They needed to be distinct from the nations. They alone were what? They were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right? God's treasured possession, Exodus 19. Because the way of the world has always been to make sin look normal and righteousness look strange. And yet, what God calls Christians to do, because the world is always trying to put us into its mold, is Christians in their gatherings together, well, they're supposed to make sin look strange and righteousness look normal. They were to champion it another way, and in doing so, they were to be that living advertisement, that bright neon sign that God is glorious. And His character and in His goodness are worth it. So if you want to know what God is like, you know He was building a community saying, look in here. You'll learn something about God from the way in which we live together. So my point is this, when it comes to insiders and outsiders, so often we want to blur those lines between the believer and the unbeliever. Right? Drawing lines, making distinctions, that's what we're warned about. That's what we're not supposed to do. It's not inclusive. It's going to make... People feel uncomfortable. And you know, if you do it, some people will feel uncomfortable. So at my installation service, one of the things I did is I took some vows before the congregation, and then I had the congregation to take some vows, but then I made the sort of the, the cardinal error. I asked the members of the congregation to stand. And in that moment, I could tell, I think I've just done something. Because you could see people anxiously looking around. No one immediately stood. Some hesitantly started to get up and then sat back down and started to get up. You see the gears were grinding. Some genuinely didn't know if they were members. And you could just tell they had never done this before. They had never been set apart like that. Called to identify themselves as members. And I could see those gears grinding, and I thought, I think I'm going to hear about this later. Perhaps I should have talked to the elders first. And you know what? I did hear about it later. Why did you do that in the service? Why did you divide the gathering like that? Why did you make the visitors uncomfortable? But you know, here's the thing. The first-time visitor, they weren't bothered. They understood this wasn't their church. I wasn't their pastor. It didn't bother them. When we stood at that moment, it wasn't the non-Christian that was bothered. It was the nominal Christian. It was the nominal Christian. The one who wanted to follow Jesus on their own terms. The one who wanted to keep the church at arm's length. The one who didn't want to be accountable to others and certainly didn't want to be responsible for others. Friends, keeping the lines blurry doesn't help anyone. It only confuses the Gospel. It only imperils our witness. Which is why the Bible doesn't call us to blur the lines The Bible calls us to sharpen those lines. Not to blur them, but to sharpen them. How do we do that? I'll keep it simple. One suggestion. Establish meaningful membership in your church. You are wondering, how am I going to go to a Nine Marks conference and someone isn't going to talk about membership? Well, here you go. (laughs) Establish meaningful membership in your church. Now, for the longest time, personally, I thumbed my nose at the idea of church membership. You could just ask Mark Dever at that back door. We had a nice little chat after he led the Lord's Supper, fenced the table as he did, and I realized I'm not a member of a church. I can't take it. And I thought, how obnoxious of it was Mark to tell me, a Christian, I couldn't take the Lord's Supper. But that's because for me, I understood sort of membership. As someone who grew up in sort of northern California on the coast, membership was like some East Coast love affair with institutions. It sounded like a country club. Like snooty, where you had to wear proper attire and and watch your behavior and pay your dues. It felt elitist, and I had no concept of how membership could possibly help me follow Jesus, or anyone else for that matter. And friend, you may think similarly, but I would just suggest to you that while membership is not so much directly argued in the Bible, it is everywhere assumed in the Bible. 
right? We're sheep. Sheep are meant to be in folds, John 10. We're called branches. What are branches to be? Grafted into the vine, John 15, Romans 11. Bricks are part of a spiritual house, 1 Peter 2. Children who now call God as their father have been what? Adopted into his family, Galatians 6, Ephesians 2. Members of the body, hands, ears, eyes, feet, are meant to be connected to the body. Think a member of the body not connected to the body. It's not a pleasant image. We see it as well in the Christian's responsibility to submit to specific leaders. Hebrews 13, 17, obey and submit to your leaders, right? Not any leaders, a specific set. The assumption is Christians know who those leaders are. They submit to them. We see it in the relationship of Christians to one another in the world. So Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, will refer to those who are inside the church, those who are outside the church, and Paul says, put the unrepentant man outside the church. And of course, if you can refer to those who are in and those who are out, that presumes clear boundary lines between the church and the world. You know, apart from the missionary situation in Acts uh, 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, I'm just not aware of any clear New Testament examples where you have Christians who are not formally joined up into particular churches where they are known by others and held accountable to others. That's just not a category we regularly see. Which means, friends, you need to restore, or if you've never done this, implement meaningful membership into your church. You need to establish that clear boundary marker again. Now, the literature will say this is like internal stuff. This is housekeeping stuff. This is the kind of thing that's going to distract you from the real work of ministry. I've had people tell that to me. But friends, I think you will struggle, if not absolutely fail, to have a clear and compelling witness for Christ five years from now if you ignore this. If you ignore it. I don't think this is just optional. I think this is absolutely essential to your work in the ministry. That's true for a church planter. It's especially true if you're interested in church revitalization. You know, when I was considering the, the pastorate for the church in Fayetteville, where I now am, they, they're a Baptist church. They talked about membership. They said they cared about membership. But when I arrived, one of the things I did is I said, hey, can you provide me a list of the members? And they couldn't do it. They actually didn't know who their members were. It took us two years combing through past meetings to figure out who the members of the church were. And when we put that directory out for the first time, you should have seen the faces. There was shock. People had thought of themselves as members for years, and they weren't members. And you could tell some were encouraged by the members in the church. Others were alarmed by who was there. Sadly, it also revealed how many absent, non-attending members we had. Hundreds, people who said, yeah, we love Jesus, we're going to go to the grave with Jesus, but we don't give a rip about Jesus' people. We had hundreds of those people. And so as elders, as we began to raise that as a concern amongst our body, one of my sweet longtime members came up after a church conference, a members meeting, and said, but pastor, it's not our job to question their profession. And I had to say to that sweet church member, actually, that's exactly our job. That's exactly our job as a church. Our job as a church through membership, that is how we stamp that passport of their citizenship into the kingdom of heaven. It's how we take it away as well. Because the local church is that institution that Jesus founded to speak on His behalf, to represent Him. It is that institution with the sole authority. No other institution has it other than the local church, Matthew 16 and 18, with the sole authority to speak of who are the gospel professors and who are not. That's the local church's responsibility. It's what we do in baptism. It's what we do in Lord's Supper. Every time we are marking out who are the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and who are not. And so many pastors have no idea that's what's happening in that moment. This one is a Christian. This, is, this one is not. If you want to think more about that, there's that little booklet, I think, in the packet of materials you were given, Understanding the Congregation's Authority. If this is a new idea to you. I highly encourage you to read that. It'll be super helpful. All right, now practically, friends, that means you need to restore this practice again into your own churches, which means you need to have a membership class. And you may need to teach that class for a while to impress these things into the people and to slowly change the DNA of your church. 
to clarify the kind of practical commitments that you understand the Bible entails between members and between members and their pastors. It means you need to close all of the side doors into the church. You need to close them and push everyone through the front door of church membership. So you actually don't love, and I'm still having this conversation with my own leaders. I'm trying to help my own leaders understand. We don't love the visitor well by letting them play a guitar up front or by letting them teach a Sunday school class or help in that community helps ministry. We don't love them well by encouraging them to do that before they've answered the more basic question of whether or not they're willing to commit to the whole body through the membership of the church. We need to start there. Press that first and most basic commitment to Jesus, beginning with their church membership. And I think if you do that, that's going to end up being a blessing, at least for two groups of people. One broadly for believers. There are all these one another commands in the New Testament commands to, one another commands rather, to love, to encourage, to guard. And all of those one another commands, that's what gives shape to our own personal discipleship. And in our pride, we often don't think we need others, but in humility, God has created us to indeed be dependent upon others. And God has set up the local church as that discipling program. So we shouldn't have to leave the church. We shouldn't have to join some other ministry or or some other group to learn how to better follow Jesus or better understand his word. That's exactly why Jesus gave us the church to do that. And we need membership because some of us as believers are too easy on ourselves. We assume all is well with us despite all the contrary evidence in our lives. My kids give me a hard time all the time. They look at the dashboard of my car. Dad, there are warning lights everywhere. What does all that mean? I'm like, oh, it's going to be fine. And then the car breaks down, right? And it's not paying attention. We can do that with our own spiritual lives. We're too easy on ourselves. And we need those formal relationships within a church and a church body to to come to us and to warn us and to admonish us, to point us back onto the path of life. And yet some Christians, like John O was saying, we're too hard on ourselves. And we need that church family to point out evidences of grace, to encourage us that the fact that we're fighting and struggling means we're still in the fight. We're in the faith. So church membership exists to help warn the complacent, to help comfort the tender. But it's good for unbelievers as well. You know, when Christians love and encourage, when Christians serve one another in these committed ways, when we move outside of our cliques, when we move outside of our affinity groups, and we care for people who have absolutely nothing in common with us except Christ, we make the gospel beautiful. For where are non Christians to go to see Jesus? They're to go to local churches. So a wise man once said, Christian preaching makes the gospel audible, but it's Christian living. And these kinds of committed relationships that membership entails, it's that kind of Christian living that makes the gospel visible. So why does it all matter? It's because, friends, in our age, and with the corrosion of our own individualism, the corrosion of of the consumerism we're in, we treat the church, we treat membership like it was some divine afterthought, like it was some accident of history, something we can add on to our Christian lives with like a Bible study or a conference or whatever else it might be. Yet the church is at the very center of God's eternal purposes. The church is at the heart of Christ's work. The church was founded by Christ, Matthew 16. It was purchased by His blood, Acts 20, 28. It is His body, 1 Corinthians 12. It is the dwelling place of His Spirit, 1 Corinthians 4. It is the chief instrument in our own daily discipleship and the evangelization of the lost and how God is ultimately going to be glorified in this world. So why, my friends, would we not want to press our people to be a part of that glorious reality? That's what we do want to press upon them. And we do that through membership.